Hello everyone and welcome to the weird, scary and horrible parts of humanity. Marco Archer Moriega, known as Kurumim, was born in Rio de Janeiro in 1961, with his family initially from Manaus, the capital of Amazonas and the seventh largest city in Brazil. He was born to a wealthy family with his mother, Dona Carolina, a state civil servant in Rio de Janeiro. He was a Roman Catholic and brought up in the faith. His mother would pass away of cancer in 2010. His time as a drug trafficker started at a young age when he engaged with Colombian cartels and as a teenager began trafficking cocaine from Medellin in Colombia to both Rio de Janeiro and the United States of America. Medellin is the center of the Medellin cartel which under Pablo Escobar would import coca from Bolivia and Peru process it in Colombia and usually traffic it into Florida, California and New York where it would be distributed. Never caught, from 1988 he began to spend much of his time in Bali, Indonesia, where he became a paragliding instructor, having frequently travelled to Southeast Asia to engage in paragliding. But this alternative career was only half-hearted at best. During his time in Indonesia, he became fluent in Bahasa Indonesian. However, he made most of his money smuggling drugs into and out of Indonesia. In 1997, he suffered a paragliding accident which left him injured. Minutes after takeoff, he fell from a 30 meter high cliff in Bali and in the fall broke his legs, broke his hip, ruptured his intestines and was never able to run again. But surviving this accident gave him a feeling of invulnerability. His most frequent route to get to Bali was to fly KLM from Rio de Janeiro through to Amsterdam to Jakarta and then get a connecting flight to Bali. Throughout his time as a drug trafficker, it was alleged that he never used a weapon on anyone. However, he became the capo of Bali in smuggling cocaine and as a result made a huge amount of money. In Brazil, he could pay $5,000 for a kilogram of cocaine or $1,000 in Peru or Bolivia and make as much as $300,000 selling it in Indonesia. He bought apartments throughout Bali, Hawaii and Holland and dined at all of the best restaurants and frequently frequented sex workers. He would later state, I've never had a different job in my life, and that he had smuggled every type of drug that exists. However, his career as a drug trafficker would eventually catch up to him. Since 1997, he had been playing Russian roulette with his life every time he smuggled drugs into and out of Indonesia, with Indonesia having implemented mandatory capital punishment for drug trafficking. On the 2nd of August 2003, Jakarta was under risk of a terrorist attack by the Jema Islamia, the arm of Al-Qaeda in Southeast Asia. An anti-terrorist alert had been triggered in mid-July when a man detained by police confessed to driving two cars full of bomb-making materials into Jakarta. Fear of an attack extended to Jakarta's Sorekano Hata International Airport. The airport had been heavily guarded since a bomb at the airport on the 28th of April 2003, which left 11 people injured. On the same day, the 2nd of August 2003, KLM Flight 0837 arrived from Amsterdam with Archer on board, wearing jeans, a shirt and leather jacket with seven pieces of luggage, including a disassembled hand glider which was four meters long, packed in a blue bag. Hidden inside one of the equipment's tubes was 29 black plastic bags with 13.4 kilograms of pure Peruvian cocaine. However, Archer believed that he was carrying 15 kilograms of cocaine. He was part of a drug smuggling deal with two partners, an Italian and another Brazilian, both based in Bali, with the trio set to earn $3.5 million. He had paid $130,000 for the drugs in Iquitos, Peru, with the deal financed by an American drug smuggler. He flew from Iquitos to Lima before flying to Manaus in the Amazonas. He then flew from Manaus to Rio de Janeiro before boarding a KLM flight to Amsterdam. He briefly stayed in Amsterdam before traveling on board KLM flight 0837 to Jakarta. He aimed to connect to a flight to Bali after a night at an airport hotel. Leaving his bags at one of the airport porters at the conveyor belt, he walked towards the exit past customs. However, the porter ordered that his bags be x-rayed with all bags bags x-rayed upon arrival at Indonesian airports. Customs officials quickly realized that there was something inside one of the tubes of the hand glider. When customs officials removed it, they cut the tube in half, looked at the tubes, with one of the tubes appearing darker than the others. 
In Bahasa Indonesian, Archer tried to explain that the dark tube was made of carbon fibre, while the other tubes were made of aluminium, which accounted for the difference of colours. However, the police officer was puzzled by Archer's nervousness, and when more officials arrived, one bought a Swiss Army knife and tapped the tube, hearing something hollow inside the tube. This tube was ultimately different from the rest. Archer was able to buy time and told officials that his passport was in one of his suitcases when in reality it was in his pocket. He headed towards his suitcase to get his passport. By this stage of the five officers overseeing Archer, three police officers had gone to find tools to open the tubes, one was watching him and one had his back towards him. Unable to run because of his paragliding accident, he managed to walk quickly and blended into the crowd, with some ease due to the arrival of two Garuda Indonesia flights. Brazenly escaping and knowing that the guards were on the lookout for a terrorist attack and did not know that he was a fugitive, he reached the first floor of the airport and went to the KLM counter aiming to purchase a ticket on the flight that he had just arrived on back to Amsterdam. He tried to buy a seat with his frequent flyer points as he only had 1 million Indonesian rupees, about $120 on him at the time. However, it was too late to buy a ticket as the flight was getting ready to board. He then went outside the airport, got into an Ojek motorcycle taxi to another passenger terminal and then got a taxi to the centre of Jakarta. The most that he could afford was two nights in a cheap hotel and he didn't know Jakarta outside of the airport. In the interim, police had found the cocaine, a record for the amount of cocaine seized within Indonesia, which remains until this day. Police closed down the airport, searched for restrooms and implemented extra surveillance at the departure gates but were unable to find Archer. Arriving at the Free Star Hotel Central with the hotel lined with security agents due to the terrorist threat in Jakarta, he knew that he couldn't stay there and went to a mall and bought a Nike hat and t-shirt as a disguise. Arriving at a two-star hotel at the reception, when asked for his passport, he said that his passport was with his girlfriend, who should be arriving soon. In his room, he smoked a marijuana cigarette, which he had smuggled from Amsterdam, drank a Bintang beer, and at a payphone, he telephoned his Italian drug smuggling partner, who was based in Bali, who had organised the drug smuggling operation with him, and told him what had happened, but the partner thought that he was being scammed by Archer. Determined to escape to Bali, at 6am the next day, he awoke, changed his clothes and went to a five-star hotel for breakfast opposite the hotel where he stayed. The breakfast cost 100,000 Indonesian rupees. With just over 600,000 Indonesian rupees, he couldn't buy a plane ticket to Bali and had to get a bus. Asked for his passport by the driver, he bribed the driver with 50,000 Indonesian rupees, about $6, in order to board without the driver seeing his passport, as by this stage his photo was across Indonesia and being circulated throughout Indonesian media. A day and a half later, the bus arrived into Denpasar on the 5th of August 2003 and he paid the driver another 50,000 rupees to get off two kilometres before the bus station, aware that police at the bus station in Bali would be looking for him. He then took a taxi to meet his partners, the Italian and the Brazilian, as well as another Brazilian who was not involved in the drug smuggling operation. The four met at the La Luciola Italian restaurant on Semniac Beach, 8 kilometers off the centre of the island. While unwilling to help him, Archer gave them his passport and took the nickname John Miller. He ended up staying in a small hotel in Sanur, a beach on the south coast of Bali. On the same day, the 5th of August 2003, one of the worst terrorist attacks since the Bali bombings in 2002 occurred in Indonesia when 12 people were killed with 147 injured in a car bomb attack outside the reception of the JW Marriott Hotel in Jakarta with the attack orchestrated by Jemma Islamia. This did divert some attention away from the arrest of Archer, however he was still wanted by authorities. On the 6th of August, he went to a five-star hotel, Ina Grand Bali Beach Hotel, next door to his cheap hotel for breakfast. In the lobby, the Brazilian drug smuggler with whom he was partnered in this operation bought a copy of the Jakarta Post, an English-language Indonesian newspaper, where police blamed the X-ray machine in Jakarta's airport for not detecting the cocaine that Archer was attempting to traffic into Indonesia. Aware that police were still after him, he bought a prepaid cell phone and called other Brazilian friends in Bali, who refused to help him. 
His Brazilian partner got him $3,000 and the two embarked for Nusa Lembongang, an hour and a half by boat from Bali. There they rented a bungalow and aimed to lay low. Both hit the beach and surfed before visiting bars and nightclubs at night as well as doing cocaine. On the 10th of August 2003, Archer devised a new escape plan, aiming to make it to East Timor where the current language is Portuguese. However, this was more than 1,000 kilometers away. Arriving in Lombok, he stayed in the Desert Point, a remote fishing village in the southwest of Lombok. His Brazilian partner went to Bali to get more money. He then found out that the Italian drug trafficker had burnt his passport. On the 14th of August, he made it to Sumbawa, staying in a surface camping area in Scar Reef. He then made it to Bali, where the other drug smuggler gave him 900,000 Indonesian rupees, and both went their separate ways, never to see each other again. Archer then aimed to get to Moyo, a few hours by boat from Sumbawa, with small inns and mostly inhospitable. On the early afternoon of the 15th of August 2003, he paid 300,000 Indonesian rupees for a boat to Moyo, leaving him with only 500,000 Indonesian rupees, about 60 US dollars. When he arrived in Moyo, he was greeted by guards of the Amanwana Resort, a five-star resort with 20 bungalows. In English, he introduced himself to the resort manager as an American tourist who had gotten lost and separated from his wife. He was given a free night in the staff's hut, a nasi goreng and a beer. This was to be his last free meal. On the morning of the 16th of August, he headed to the resort's marina with the aim of escaping when he saw heavily armed police arriving in boats. The skipper of the boat to Nusa Lembongang and Moyo Island were in handcuffs on board the police boats. Police had finally arrested him after 14 days on the run. This brought to an end his 25 years as a drug trafficker. He was convicted as a drug trafficker and sentenced to death in 2004. He alleged that he had resorted to drug smuggling in order to pay for hospital bills in Singapore, but this was absolute rubbish and rejected by the court. He shared a cell with fellow Brazilian drug smuggler Rodrigo Gulate. By the way, we will be doing a future video on Rodrigo Goulart so do not forget to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to be informed of when that video comes out. Archer seemed cocky throughout his time on death row, telling a reporter when talking about his failed drug run, wouldn't you do the same thing for $3.5 million? And stated that he would not have lived the life that he did if he hadn't resorted to drug trafficking. Held in Tangerand prison, his mother bribed prison officers to see him and stay the night with him. And he used poorer prisoners for everything from waiters to janitors. He was able to use his money to get a better cell with a TV, a VCR, a radio, a fan and open doors to a garden. This was considered to be a privilege for a Brazilian prison cell. The main saviour for Archer, however, was President Susilio Bambang Yudhoyono, who implemented a moratorium on capital punishment from 2008 to 2013. However, President Yudhoyono was constitutionally barred from seeking a third term in office in 2014, and in the election on the 9th of July 2014, President Joko Widodo won the Indonesian election with 53.15% of the vote as part of the Great Indonesia Coalition. Upon assuming office on the 20th of October 2014, President Widodo warned that there would be no clemency for drug convicts and re-enacted the death penalty within Indonesia. The Brazilian government of Dilma Rousseff launched several requests for clemency for Archer's life, but these were all denied. Requests were also made by Pope Francis, Amnesty International and former Brazilian President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, but these were all denied. Additionally, a direct appeal for clemency was made by Archer in December 2014, in which he stated, I'm aware that I made a very serious mistake, but I deserve one more chance because everyone makes a mistake, but this was rejected. Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff launched last-ditch attempts to save Archer's life in late 2014 and early 2015, but these came to nothing. He was transported to Nusa Kambangan Island in central Java, 400 kilometers from Jakarta, in January 2015 to face his execution. His aunt Maria de Lourdes Archer Pinto visited her nephew for one last time as the only member of his family to visit him 
while on Nusa Kambangan Island. She told the media, the president is not God. Marco may have been wrong. He served 11 years in prison and does not deserve to pay with his life. His aunt had bought letters from friends and family as well as cod from Portugal, which was one of Archer's last wishes and turned out to be his final meal. He was comforted by Roman Catholic priest Charles Burroughs, however he had his last rites denied on Nusa Kambangan Island as there was no letter from Archer's attorney Ribo Akbar requesting for a priest to be present. This was highly criticised by the Brazilian embassy in Jakarta. Indonesian prison officials later apologised stating that it was an erroneous decision by the prison on Nusa Kambangan Island as a result of a lack of communication. On the day of his execution in the early morning hours of the 18th of January 2015, he was allegedly dragged from his cell crying and said help me, help me to Burroughs and defecated his trousers because he was so scared. Archer chose to be executed on foot and blindfolded, dying with a single sh shot fired into his chest. Akbar stated in an interview that he believed that Brazil's clemency would be successful and he did not believe that his client would lose his life. He was amongst the first group of people to be executed by the government of Joko Widodo, with four other people executed in the same place. These were drug smugglers Nigerian Daniel Enemwo, Malawian Namayona Dennis, Indonesian Rani Andriani, and Dutch citizen Ang Kiem Soy. Additionally, Vietnamese drug smuggler Phan Phi Bich Han was executed at the same time in the Boyolali district in central Java. In line with Indonesian legislation and precedent, there were 12 members of the firing squad present. However, only three of the 12 guns were loaded with live bullets, so they would not know who had fired the lethal shots. By the way, we did an earlier video on the execution of Dutch citizen Ang Kiem Soy, so don't forget to check that video out. While the 53-year-old's execution did seem inevitable after 11 years on death row combined with the rise of the Widodo government, his execution caused a deep rift between the Brazilian and Indonesian governments. President Rousseff recalled the Brazilian ambassador Paulo Alberto da Silveira Soras to Brazil from Jakarta in order for consultation. President Rousseff stated that she was distressed and outraged. A spokesman said in a statement, using the death penalty, which is increasingly rejected by the international community, seriously affects relations between our countries. However, then President Widodo defended the execution, stating the war against the drug mafia should not be half-hearted measures, because drugs have really ruined the good life of the drug users and their families. There is no happiness in life to be gained from drug abuse. The country must be present and fight with drug syndicates head on. Archer's body was cremated at the request of his aunt, with his ashes returned to Rio de Janeiro. A Catholic Mass took place at Nossa Senora das Graças Church in Beco do Macedo on the morning of the 12th of February 2015. The Mass was restricted to family and overseen by Father Morgo Cleto. His ashes were deposited in the family's grave in Rio de Janeiro. Thank you for watching, please do yourself a favour and hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to inform you when new videos come out. Also, why not hit that like button and leave a nice comment, it helps more than you know, and your support is always appreciated. Until next time, stay awesome, stay classy, be kind to everyone you meet, have an amazing day, and remember, truth is always more interesting than fiction.